around the turn of the first millennium, give or take a few years, a child was born in Judea. He was born into royalty. His arrival was told about from Jerusalem to Rome, everywhere in between. He was given the finest accommodations, his own room in the palace of the king, finest handmade crib, warmest wool blankets, and a team of caregivers to watch over him night and day. Gifts would have come in from all over the world, monarchs and rulers from afar, paying their respects for the birth of a future king. He would spend his childhood in the royal court in ancient Rome, making friends with imperial princes like Claudius and Drusus. And as an adult, he would sit on a throne in a palace in Judea and be called king. The birth of Agrippa, the grandson of Herod the Great, was announced by Roman heralds in all provinces and regions of the known world. This child born in the palace in Jerusalem was front page news and the most important people in the world needed to know about it. Anyone who was anyone would have been told. But not too long after that, just a few years, there was another birth in Judea. This one received no fanfare, no announcements from Roman officials. The news would barely reach beyond the borders of the little village in which it happened. For this child, there was no room in the palace, no handmade crib, no wool blankets, certainly no team of caregivers to watch over him. No one in Rome would have heard about his birth or cared if they had. Compared to Herod Agrippa, the child born in the stable in Bethlehem was a nothing story. And in fact, the only ones who were told about it were perhaps the least important people in the world. Welcome to week two, week three, excuse me, of our Advent series, Characters of Christmas. We'll be in Luke chapter two this morning. Feel free to turn there with me if you'd like to follow along. In 4 BC, Caesar was the, the ruler of the known world. He was so powerful that most people considered him to be something more than human. And they thought that he was somehow divine. You know, sometimes children, when they're being overly selfish or pouty, you know, they have to be told, you know, the world doesn't revolve around you. You ever have anybody have to tell you that or you have to tell your own children that? Well, nobody ever told Caesar that because, well, it kind of did. And that's why Luke writes uh, in verse 1, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor in Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. By own town, that refers to your hometown. So if you had grown up and moved off to start a business or um, you know, make a living somewhere else, you would travel back to where you were born, back to where your family likely still lived, where your ancestors were from, to be counted in the census in your particular region. And so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Notice here that Joseph lived in Nazareth, and it is only because of a decree of Caesar that he and Mary are going to find themselves in Bethlehem at all. Little did Augustus know that his demand for a census would force a humble carpenter and his pregnant teenage fiancée from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Little did anyone know that this was God's will that it might be fulfilled what the prophet had spoken, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, in the town of David. And we're reminded that God uses the wills and whims of tyrants to bring about his own good and glorious plans. 
And Luke tells us, verse six, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. John's gospel would later say that he came unto his own and his own did not receive him. The savior of the world, the single most significant person to have ever been born and he's laid in a feeding trough among animals. Caesar and Herod should have bowed at his crib. Royal officials from every nation in the earth should have been present for his birth. There should have been parades in the streets and ceremonies held in his honor, but there was nothing. Just a stable and a manger and a world that neither knew nor cared about his arrival. As Christian author Daniel Darling says, Christmas is a powerful reminder that what is important in heaven is often unimportant on earth. And in the midst of this unnoticed, somewhat unremarkable event, the strangest thing happens. Verse eight, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. I bet they were. Of all people to whom God might announce his arrival, of all groups to whom he might send the angelic host, I can assure you that shepherds would be near the bottom of just about everybody's list. I mean, this is God's own son, the the promised Messiah, the one Israel has been waiting on for hundreds of years, the savior of the whole wide world, and yet the angels don't appear to the high priest. The declaration doesn't come in the middle of the temple. They don't descend on Caesar's court or Herod's palace informing the leaders of the day. The angels have good news to bring, good news for the whole world and the group to whom they appear are shepherds. It's almost as if the angels got lost on their way to tell someone important, you know, like they were on their way to Jerusalem, but, but they got sidetracked. Maybe, maybe they're like me, they get lost easily. You know, I'll be, I'll be uh, halfway to Clyde, realize I missed a turn somewhere trying to go home. You know, maybe the angels are, are directionally challenged too. Maybe, maybe they're trying to find the temple or, or the palace, but they just happen upon this field. And, and even though they wanted to share the news with somebody important, they, they kind of had to settle for the first group of people that they came across. Shepherds, it's a peculiar thing. John Calvin wrote, though God had at his command many honorable and distinguished witnesses, he passed by them and chose shepherds, persons of humble rank and of no account among men. Being a shepherd was hardly a coveted job in the ancient world certainly a far cry from the glamour of being a fisherman or a carpenter. Even among the blue-collar jobs, nobody wanted to be a shepherd. I mean, no one grew up thinking, gee, I hope I can make it as a shepherd one day. No, they thought, well, if I don't get chosen to be a rabbi, if if the fishing business doesn't take off, if I can't cut it as a stonemason, no pun intended, okay, I guess I'll have to be a shepherd. I guess if nothing else works out, I'll be a shepherd. Shepherds were the last thing anybody wanted to be. And it's no mystery why. I mean, did you notice they live in a field? You spent all your time watching and herding a flock of sheep. You had to wrangle obstinate animals all the time. You had to keep your flock fed and healthy. You had to fend off predators like wolves and lions and bears. Bears! Got any office fans in the house? Which bear is best? 
I don't think the shepherds, I think the shepherds knew which bear was worst. You know, like they knew which bear you did not want to see coming out of those woods. This was not a job that anyone wanted. And shepherds weren't exactly what you would call the most respected members of society. They were poor and dirty and sweaty and not good for much else, but being a shepherd. But despite their shabby social standing, God has always had a strange affinity for shepherds. If you look back over the prominent figures of biblical history, you don't have to search all that long before you realize there are more than one or two shepherds. In Genesis chapter 12, God calls a man named Abram. Abram tends to his flock as he follows God toward the land of Canaan. After a while, God makes a covenant with him, promises to make him into a great nation, changes his name to Abraham. And today, billions of people the world over, Christians, Jews, and Muslims alike, all trace their spiritual roots back to this man that we call the father of faith. Abraham was a shepherd. Just a few pages over in Genesis 29, Abraham's grandson Jacob tends his uncle Laban's flock and then takes some of his own when he leaves Laban's house. Not long after that will Jacob's name be changed to Israel. He will have 12 sons that will become the foundation of the nation that God calls his own. He will be remembered throughout history as the father of the nation of Israel. Jacob was a shepherd. 400 years or so after that, there comes a young man named Moses, tended his father-in-law's flock. Shortly after, God appears to him in a burning bush. He makes him the leader of his people as God brings them out of slavery in Egypt. Moses shepherds the people of, of Israel as they leave Egypt on their journey to the promised land. The man who would be remembered through all generations as the giver of the law and God's chosen vessel in a crucial time in Israel's history. Moses was a shepherd. Just a few hundred years after that, over in 1 Samuel 16, there's a young boy living in Israel. He's the runt of his brothers, and as the youngest and smallest and least significant, he's given the job that nobody else wanted of tending his father Jesse's flock. But then David slays the giant Goliath and becomes the king of Israel. Remember, through all generations as a great king and into his own family line will be born the Messiah. The very town in which this will happen will be called his town, the town of David. David was a shepherd. You see, the truth is that there have always been shepherds in the rich history of God's people. And they have not been insignificant or off to the side where you wouldn't notice them. They have been the central figures of the story. They've been the ones called faithful, the ones to father the nations, the ones to lead in times of crisis, the ones to become kings, the ones who have prophesied, the ones closest to God. Read somewhere, he uses the foolishness of the world to confound the wise takes the ones passed over and ignored to be his chosen instruments. He picks the least likely and then propels them into prominence. It has always been the least of these that God chooses for greatness. So it's really no mystery that the shepherds would play a prominent role in this story too. It's the shepherds who are chosen to bear witness to the work of God. And we are reminded that for centuries, Abraham the shepherd and Jacob the shepherd and Moses the shepherd and David the shepherd have been bearing witnesses to God's work in the world all along. And so it should be that on the night of Christ's birth, when God gets ready to announce his arrival of the Messiah, the the angels would skip over the chief priests and the religious councils. They would ignore the governors and the emperors. They would be sent to the middle 
of a field where they would find the shepherds. The angel says, verse 10, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. I'm afraid what might get lost sometimes when we read that famous passage is the personal declaration, the personal nature of that declaration told to the lowliest in the community. You see, the angels don't view the shepherds as simply go-betweens or or messengers to carry the news to the important folks. But they say, look, I bring you good news. A savior has been born to you. This will be a sign to you. And the good news of the Christmas story is that Christ has come for you personally. That's why this picture of the angels announcing to, of all people, shepherds, is so powerful. Because the Jesus that we worship is not an aristocratic Jesus. He's not a mansion in the Hamptons kind of Jesus. He's not an office on the corner office on the hill kind of Jesus. He's not a Jesus for the rich or a Jesus for the famous or a Jesus for the powerful. This good news comes to the least of these and then it is for all the people but it comes to the shepherds because see, if it first came to the religious elites like the high priest or the Pharisees or or the social elites like Herod or, or those in Caesar's house, these groups would have built walls. They would have drawn dividing lines and taken it upon themselves to determine who's in and who's out. They would have disqualified those who could not meet the same standards that they could meet, but the shepherds do not exclude others because they too often have known what it's like to be excluded. They have no special claims by which they might keep others out. The shepherds have no delusions of superiority or worthiness. The truth is, if it's free to the shepherds, it's free to everybody. And in the kingdom of God, there is no regard to wealth or power or success or renown, but each and every soul is precious to the one who made it. God has long had a tendency to pick out those who have been passed over, who have been undervalued or overlooked by the world. He has a habit of exalting the humble. And that's why on that special night, he honors the shepherds as being the first to hear of the news of Christ's birth. And we've noted this theme throughout scripture of shepherds bearing witness to the work of God. This goes so far that the Old Testament writers themselves started to see God as some kind of divine shepherd. When Jacob blesses his grandsons, he says, may the God who has been my shepherd all my life bless these boys. Isaiah would say like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arms, he will gather the lambs. Micah prayed to the Lord, shepherd your people with your scepter, the flock of your possession. Jeremiah declared, he who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. Almost every Old Testament writer, almost every prophet uses this same language and this same imagery to speak of God and his leadership of Israel. The most famous example, of course, being Psalm 23, when the former shepherd boy turned king writes, the Lord is is my shepherd. And so on the very first night, before anyone knows anything about him, when they could have made him out to be anything they wanted him to be, when all the groups in the world, had they recognized who he was, would have laid claim to him on that special night. It is not the kings or the dignitaries the angels visit. It is not the chief priests or the scribes who are given the news, but it is the shepherds who are called, beckoned to a stable in David's town. Shepherds beckoned near to bear witness to the one who will be called the good 
shepherd. And so, verse 15, when the angels had left them, gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem, see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The first preachers were shepherds. They weren't rich or powerful. They, they had very little religious education. They were given no respect in their society, and yet somehow they were chosen to be the very first witnesses to the arrival of Christ. Luke 2 and the story of the shepherds is a striking reminder that God sees value where the world doesn't and that it's often his desire to use people no one expects to do remarkable things. Perhaps someone like you. Sometimes people think they can't be used by God because they've made too many mistakes, you know, or, or they're not this, or they're not that. They aren't smart enough. They're not articulate enough. They don't know the Bible well enough or whatever. But notice that the shepherds, poor dirty, likely illiterate, have nothing to offer to God. And he requires nothing of them except their obedience. Their faith transformed their lives. If you want to be used by God, take a note from the shepherds. They didn't sit around staring into the sky. They got up and hurried. They ran to Bethlehem. They confirmed what the angel told them and then they spread the word to anyone who would listen. I'm afraid the temptation for us at Christmas time is to just get full of the feels. Sing the songs and listen to the sermons and buy the presents and then move into another year mostly unchanged by the holiday. But if we really believe all this, it should change everything about our lives. If the Christmas story really happened, then the good news that the angels brought is good news for us too. And if Christ has really been born in Bethlehem, then he must be born in our hearts also. If the gospel is true, then it should drive us from our proverbial fields to the side of the manger and then into the world as heralds of this amazing gift. The shepherds respond in faith and their, their faith took them to a place, their, their lives and a purpose and a meaning greater than anything they could have ever dreamed of. They'd been overlooked by the world all their lives, but God had chosen them for something far better than anything the world could have ever offered. And Daniel Darling says they became the world's first missionaries, the first in a long line of ordinary, unheralded messengers of the gospel. God is on the move building his church around the world, mostly through people you will never hear of. Folks with in, with, without significant Twitter followings, with no official titles, and of whom the world is not worthy. When Agrippa was born in Judea, Roman heralds would have announced his arrival in every province in the known world. Anyone who was anyone would have been told. When Jesus was born in the same region a few years later, the only ones told about it, who heard about it, were the shepherds. The gospel is certainly for all people, but in God's upside-down kingdom, it's the poor who are made rich, the mourning who are given reason to dance the humble who are exalted and the last who are told first. Too many 
clamor to get into Herod's palace. They long for the reception of Agrippa, the riches and the fame that come with it. All the while, the real action is happening in the middle of a field somewhere where the poor and lowly are learning what it means to be blessed. Those in Jerusalem and and Rome remain mostly unchanged, oblivious to Jesus' birth or what it meant for the world. It was only those who were humble enough to receive it, who were faithful enough to follow, who found God in a stable among the sheep. Here are questions for reflection and discussion this week. Why do you think God used so many shepherds to accomplish his purposes? Where do you see yourself in the story? And how does God want to use you during this holiday season? Let's pray together. Father, this morning as we consider the story we find in Luke chapter 2, the story of the shepherds, we're mindful, God, that it is your mysterious will to use what the world calls foolishness to show your wisdom, what the world calls weakness to show your strength. Father, I pray that if there be anybody in this room this morning who feels insignificant, who feels overlooked or undervalued or passed over, that they would be inspired by your heart this morning and what we have seen you doing throughout biblical history, throughout world history, God, we confess as we look around church history, we recognize that you choose the least of these to bring about your great and glorious plans that you work through those that no one would expect to do remarkable things. I pray, Lord, that we would not be a people who clamor for the fame and the riches and the reception of an Agrippa but that like the shepherds, you would find us faithfully serving in our fields, the fields in which you've placed us. God, that you would find us faithful, that you would use that faithfulness in ways that only you can. In this holiday season, Lord, I pray that